I want to transition it over to the people at IP Horgan. Uh, we went out and looked for some of the smartest intellectual property uh, attorneys, lawyers, both in, that we knew in the Chicago area. They were very gracious to come out here. And uh, so they'll be giving a presentation on just exactly that, intellectual property, uh, some copyright issues. They'll be talking about specific situations and, and things that we get involved in in live events and hopefully giving you some clear answers. So I, I thank you again for being here. Um, I look forward to a great presentation from the gentleman and lady who will be representing a little bit later on. So with that, let me introduce uh, Oh, yes, and, and the brain is frying right now. Chris Lay and Dermot Horgan from IP Horgan. Thank you, Thank you sir. Appreciate it. In 1974, the undisputed and undefeated heavyweight boxing champion of the world, George Foreman, met a resurgent Muhammad Ali in what became known as the Rumble in the Jungle. Many people said it was the greatest sporting event of the 20th century. Ali won in eight rounds with a knockout. Not since then has any fight captured the public imagination, quite like the recent Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao contest. I was in San Diego on the evening of June 2nd, and it seemed like every bar in San Diego was showing the fight, and most of them were charging for admission. G&G &G Closed Circuit Productions was actually handling the licensing of that, and apparently their minimum rates for getting a public view license was something of the range of $5,000 and the prices went up from there. And that was for even for relatively small venues. Private view licenses, the type of license that you or I might have bought if we wanted to watch it at home, were going for less than $100. What seems to have happened is that many bars and pubs bought private view licenses and then made access available to their patrons. Well, that might have seemed like a good idea at the time but it's not playing out so well now. G&G &G tracked who was buying what. Dermot Horgan's Sports Bar and Brill, Grill. One private view license. Really? So what they did was they retained a company called Audit Masters to track and investigate who actually was purchasing what licenses and what was going on. And now the, the shakedown is in, is in full flight. And there's plenty for those bars and restaurants to be concerned about because under copyright law, there's a thing called statutory damages, which means that you know, a single instance of infringement can result in liability of up to $150,000. And that's without the copyright owner having to, to show any losses. If the copyright owner can establish that maybe you made profits or you made money that was in excess of that, the damages can be even higher. Many of you have probably heard of the, the recent case involving Pharrell Williams and uh, Robin Thicke over Blurred Lines. Well, the damages paid out in that, or at least the award of damages in that, was over $7 million. So going back to the, the fight, my guess is that many of the bars and restaurants involved in that, they're going to settle those amicably and quickly because as a business decision, making a quick uh, settlement at ten, twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 is going to look like a, a smart move relative to the potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars in damages that might otherwise uh, be in front of them. You know, copyright law, this is the same thing that brought down Napster in our own recent memory. You know, back in 2001, it was huge claims based on unlicensed copying and unlicensed downloading. And for many of you as event organizers or event sponsors, that's the same type of liability that you face. And the issue with copyright law, it's tricky. You know, the, the, it's a great illustration of special interests and special influence at work. 
the two most complicated pieces of legislation on the books in the United States are in second place, the tax code, and number one, copyright law. The movie, It's a Wonderful Life, is probably a good example of that. You know, many of you may know that the copyright on the movie expired back in 1974. But every time that movie shows up on, uh, on TV around holiday time, the channels still have to pay license fees for that. Well, how's that? The copyright expired. Well, the copyright in the movie expired, but the copyright in the underlying novel on which it's based still continues and is going to be around for another 20 years or so. Well, you can't show the movie without using the story, and since the story is covered by copyright, you've got to get a license. So copyright law giveth and it taketh away. It's complicated stuff. Today, we're going to talk about music and video licensing. And we're going to try to boil this down to three simple principles, MP, MV, MP. If you're playing music in public, you're probably going to need a license. If you're using music in a video, you're probably going to need a license. And if you're playing film or movies in public, you're probably going to need a license. So our plan today is to set up some simple scenarios, hopefully situations that are representative of the types of issues that you fail, face during the, the course of your day-to-day -day lives. And if you keep in mind, we're going to ask some questions based on those, but if you keep in mind the MP, MV, MP thing, hopefully you won't go too far wrong. Now, I gotta warn you, you're not going to be entirely right in every instance, but at least you're not going to be playing go fish at the copyright poker table when all the chips are on the line. So now I'm going to ask my colleague Chris Lay to provide a quick overview of uh, copyright principles. Thank you, Dermot. Um, before we go into the scenarios that Dermot mentioned, I'd like to go through some basic conce uh, concepts of copyright law to provide some context for the scenarios we're going to present today. Um, copyright is a, a form of property right. It's a, a form of uh, intellectual property right that confers certain exclusive rights to an author or a creator of original works. Um, these uh, take um, many different forms, uh, as you can see behind me. Uh, it, they can be uh, books, music compositions, and a variety of, uh, they're fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Although copyright is a form of intellectual property, it cannot be copy, you cannot copyright an idea. So for example, when Ayn Rand wrote her famous book, The Fountainhead, when she had the, the concept in her head and knew all the details and even described them to a neighbor, that was not uh, susceptible to copyright protection. It was only when she wrote the words down in a tangible medium of expression that copyright protection attached. So the types of works uh, you can see behind me, there's a list of, um, if we can go to the next slide, there's a list of types of works that are susceptible to copyright protection. Today we're going to focus on three, music compositions, music recordings, and audiovisual works. Now copyright protection provides certain exclusive rights that can be boiled down to five different types. The right to copy, the right to distribute, the right to prepare derivative works, the right to perform in public, and the right to display in public. Now to illustrate some of these rights, um, I'd like to present some scenarios. This CD, if you go out and buy this CD, this is the Mark Ronson CD that Uptown Funk is on. You can play this in your house, you can play it in your car, anything for personal use, you can do it simply for the cost of this CD. But now let's say you want to hire stage right to play music like this at an event. Well, you can't you do that without a license. You have to get a performance rights license. And to get that, you have to go to one of the performance rights societies, such as ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC, which allows you, with that license, to have access to their entire catalog of hundreds of thousands of songs, which can be played by stage right at your event. Now these licenses are not expensive. So for today, for example, for this event, 
an ASCAP license would have cost less than $150. Now let's say you wanted to take Uptown Funk from this CD and put it in a video that you want to use at your event. The performance rights license would no longer apply. For that type of use in a video, you would need to get two licenses. One, a license from a publisher for the underlying composition, which is called a sync license. And in addition to that, you would need what's called a master use license from the record company or music company that owns the copyright and the recording itself. Now these types of licenses typically are very expensive. They can have a wide range, but the more famous the song, you can count on the, the expense. It can go up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And either entity, the publisher or the record company, can say no. They can simply say, we're not going to license this song to you for any price. Now finally, let's say an event planner wanted to have a theme for an event, say don't stop believing, and wanted to provide a memento for each of the guests who maybe paid $1,000 a plate to be there, and wanted to give them a CD of a re-recorded version of Don't Stop Believing to walk out with in their goodie bag. Now to do this, as long as it's a re-recorded version, the event planner would simply need to get a mechanical license from the Harry Fox Agency. This costs literally 9.1 cents a piece. So if you had a, an event with 500 attendees and wanted to give a CD of a re-recorded version to each one of them, it would cost $45.5. It's not much. But keep in mind that the mechanical license only applies if it's a re-recorded version. If you wanted to use the, journey, the, the famous Journey uh, recording of Don't Stop Believing, you'd have to approach the music recording company and get a license from them to use that. And with that, I'd like to turn this back to Dermot. So now we're going to play a game of snakes and ladders, copyright style with Jim. Uh, basically, what we're going to do is go through a number of scenarios, and then we're going to present uh, a simple question. And we're going to ask you to give us your answer, what you think is the best answer using the handheld devices. And then we'll explain our thinking on, on those questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to lay out the first scenario for us. OK, the first scenario is the event planner has been hired to produce a retirement party for a CEO at a well-known hotel. And there's 600 people that are going to be in attendance. And the event planner has hired Stage Right to provide audio and visual services. Stage Right has been asked to play CDs of recordings uh, for dinner and for breaks during the presentation. Now, our first question has one additional fact. The hotel where the event's taking place has an annual performance license with ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Now, the question is, do those licenses cover Stage Right's playing of music at this event? Excellent, the no's have it. And the no's are correct because the standard ASCAP BMI CSAC license will specifically exclude special events, conferences, and seminars at the hotels. So they're not covered by the hotel's license. You're gonna need a separate license to cover that event. Chris. All right, then if the hotel license doesn't cover that, then would stage right go out and get a license from each of ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC? And the yeses have it. Another thing about copyright law is it's not democratic. In this particular instance, it's not really the responsibility of stage right to get the license. It's really the resp primary responsibility of whoever is sponsoring that event. Remember, when ASCAP or one of the PROs goes after someone, it's the bar that gets sued, not the DJ. And so in this instance, the primary responsibility is on the event organizer. Chris. All right, now let's say the hotel has a great relationship with the event planner and wants to save the event planner the cost of these licenses, so the hotel decides to pipe in the music 
into the event so that the event planner doesn't have to pay. Does this work or does the event planner still need to get his or her own licenses? Excellent. And it's really a rephrasing of the first question because, again, these licenses are restrictively written, so special events, seminars, and conferences are excluded, so a special license is going to be required. You cannot just pipe in music from that's playing elsewhere in the hotel. You're still going to need a license. Chris, I think you have one more scenario. All right, so let's say the CEO for whom this party is being uh, created uh, gets irritated at the whole idea of licenses and uh, reverts to her previous career. She had actually recorded a number of songs in her earlier career, three of which were hits. And she says, look, I'm not gonna have stage right play any recordings. I'm gonna bring my guitar and I'm gonna play three of my hits for the crowd. In that scenario, does the event planner still need to get a license for the CEO to perform her own songs? Once more, we see the capricious nature of copyright law in action. When you sign up with a PRO, one of the performance rights associations, you give them the exclusive right to license your work for public performance. So in this instance, our Renaissance lady, who's the CEO, the successful CEO and previous pop star, cannot perform her own music without a PRO license being in place. So the takeaway, now I, I should mention there, that's what the technical rule is. The reality on this is the chances of you getting sued are probably nil, maybe even lower, but technically there's a, a violation of the, the, the rights with the PRO. The takeaway from this is if you're playing music in public, you need a license, yes sir? So who would potentially sue well, in it's that CEO situation. In a worst case scenario, it would be the PRO because they probably have a breach of contract with the owner of the copyright because they have the exclusive right to license under their internal arrangement. It's not strictly a copyright type violation, it's more of a contractual one, but that's the way it works. So again, music in public, you should assume that you're going to require a license. We now have a slightly different scenario involving some different issues. All right, so in this scenario, the event planner is uh, producing a black tie awards gala at, for a major corporation at, at a convention center near the airport. And there's 1,500 people invited, $1,000 a plate, and there are three awards being conferred to honorees who have given uh, significant contributions uh, to the corporation's charitable foundation. Now, for each of the three honorees, the event planners created a seven-minute video and uh, has gotten music for each of the three. For two of them, the event planner has gone to a local music production company and hired a composer to write custom music. And for the third one, the event planner has gone out and gotten a recording of a famous song written by a blues artist. Now under this scenario, will the performance licenses the event planner has gotten for the event from ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC be sufficient to cover the use of the famous recording of the blues artist in the third video. And the no's have it and the no's are correct. In this instance you need two specific licenses. You need a license from the publisher of the composition, that's the sync license, in order to use the music in conjunction with the video. And you also need a master use license for the recording. And neither of those are controlled by the PROs. Both of these are licenses that you're going to have to negotiate separately with the ownership of those rights, the, the, license, the publisher for the composition and the owner of the master recording. Chris. Right now for the other two videos, the event planner went out and got custom music for this event, for these two videos. So in that scenario, does the event planner need a license from the composers of that, the music for the first two videos?
And the answer here is no. And in this instance, it's correct, because there's going to be an implied license that you can use it for that event. But what you might want to think about when you're commissioning music, if I, Chris here is a composer, if I commission Chris to write a piece of music for, for me and I pay him you know, $5,000 to write it, Chris is the composer and he's also the author. And that means that Chris owns the copyright in that music, not I, even though I paid for it. In order for me to become the owner of it, I need to have a written agreement with Chris whereby he assigns that right to me. So if you're setting up events and you're commissioning specific music for it or whatever, you really need to cover that by an agreement. You're probably okay for the individual event that you've commissioned it for, but if you want to you know, use it one day at the, the CEO's birthday and the next week at the CFO's retirement party, you may not be covered for the second one. So that's something to keep in mind. Always have an agreement, have it in writing, and make sure that it answers these resolutions. At worst, it should give you a license to do whatever you want with it. At best, you really should become the outright owner. Chris. All right, now let's say, back, going back to the third video with a famous song from the blues artist, let's say the event planner doesn't, wants to use the song but doesn't want to pay $30,000 for the master use license for the actual recording. So she decides to go to a local composer and say, um, would you re-record this song for this video uh, to avoid paying the master use license fee? Does this work? And in this answer, in this instance, the, again, it's not democratic, I'm afraid. It's sometimes not representative. In this instance, it does work. Mm -hmm. The only license you require in this instance is for the, underlying, for the underlying composition. In this, the event planner, organizer, took her advice and made sure that she got the rights to the recording and hence was able to use the recording. And there would have been an implied license for that. And hopefully she got an assignment so that she can use it again in the future in other instances. But again, you need to define what you're getting and you need to have it in writing. Chris. All right, so let's say the event planner decides to make CD copies of that re-recorded re version of the blues song to be given to each of the invitees. Does the sync license she got from the under, for the underlying composition cover the right to make these CDs for the attendees? And the no's have it, and they're absolutely correct. The sync license allows you to use the composition in the video. It does not allow you to uh, duplicate and distribute CD copies of the music. That's a separate license. That's something that has to be acquired on a separate basis. Uh, typically, you get that from someone like the uh, Harry Fox Agency, and you pay you know, 9.1 cents a copy or whatever for song, but it's a separate license. So one of the takeaways here is when you're negotiating for music rights, whether it's in a video or whether you're just using the composition, you need to make sure that you're getting the rights that you're, you, you think you are and have the freedom to use that you think you're paying for. So the takeaway here is that when you're using music in a video that's going to be on public view, you need to make sure that you have a license that accurately addresses that. We have one more scenario for you that kind of goes into a slightly different area. And I'm going to ask uh, Chris to set that up for us. All right. Uh, this, I would imagine, would be somewhat of a nightmare scenario. So a, a, a charity event has been scheduled for mid-October, months out. And the event planner, as it were, a week out, realizes that it's going to be game seven of the Cubs versus White Sox World Series. And so she's very afraid uh, that at the event, either people will not show up at all or that they'll leave the ballroom and go down to the first floor and watch the game in the bar, which will totally destroy the live auction. So to alleviate that problem, the event planner decides to have stage right wheel in three large screens like this and provide a live stream of the game so that the people can stay in the room and watch the game. And 
by the way, while the screens are in place, the event planner decides, well, at the end of the evening, we'll uh, show a three-minute clip of the movie Rocky, uh, the, the part where Sylv Sylvester Stallone is screaming for Adrian at the end of the movie. Now, in that scenario, <clears throat> if the World Series is on a major network, would the event planner need a license? And the yeses have it. You can obviously hear Al Michaels ringing in your ear. This event is licensed for the private use of our audience. And that's exactly the way it is. You do need a special license from that. A more interesting scenario here is who do you get the license from? Do you get it from Fox or ESPN in the case of Major League Baseball? Well, surprisingly, you know, generally the major leagues control and own the broadcast and uh, rights in their work. So if I'm looking to get a public license for Major League Baseball, I have to deal with Major League Baseball. Same thing with the NFL. It's not necessarily the network that you're going to end up dealing with. This can vary from thing to thing, but it's certainly an issue to uh, keep in mind that you're, you're actually talking to the right people. Next, Chris, please. All right, let's say um, there's not enough money. Oh, we have a question, Dermot. Oh. So are you calling that morning when you find out you need to show the game to see if you can get a license, and how long does the licensing take to get it? Well, getting their attention, they're generally pretty good at getting back to you, but I wouldn't want to leave it that morning. I think I'd want to leave it the week before and uh, you know, do it in that sort of a timeline. But they are pretty responsive when you reach out to them on these particular issues. And you know, they, they, they lay it all out there. A lot of them have pretty standard terms and conditions. And so long as you fit within that, it's not going to be hugely complicated. And what would be the price of something like that? They vary substantially depending upon what you're doing. So if it's a for-profit event, the pricing is going to be stretched one way if you're charging admission or something like that. But it's not unusual. With a movie, for instance, which we see quite a bit, you're typically looking at something in the region of maybe $5 a, a person. And a TV event is probably not going to be dramatically different from that. Now, let's say the event, there's simply not enough money in the budget to get a license from uh, Major League Baseball or the network to provide a live stream. And the event planner just kind of walks down the back and says to stage right, you know, um, you know, the game's on. Can you just happen to accidentally have it on one of your small monitors over your control board? <laughs> would would uh, she or he need a, a license for that? And the yeses have it, and they're absolutely right. This accidental showing does indeed require a license if it's going to be a public view thing. Something to keep in mind here, I know Chris said, you know, tongue in cheek, that it was accidental. Uh, copyright infringement doesn't have to be purposeful. It can be completely unintentional. Uh, after the Beatles broke up, the first album that George Harrison released uh, had a song in it called My Sweet Lord which was remarkably similar to an earlier song by the Chiffons called He's So Fine. Well, the judge in that case agreed that the song was indeed a, a copy of the earlier one. But he also went on to say that he did not think this was a case of purposeful copying. In fact, he said this was a case of subconscious plagiarism. But that didn't make any difference. It was still held to be a copyright infringement. And George Harrison still had to pay half a million dollars in damages, which he did back in the, uh, back in the 70s after the, the case resolved. I love this microphone thing. Um, who's monitoring this? Who would know that that happened to even charge them? This, this situation, how, who would anybody, how well, would they know? Of course, there's what's technically the rule and what's practically going to happen. And we all know that most infringement goes completely unpunished. That's not the same. And for the most part, it's not going to be worth it to them. You know, you've got 20 people in your backyard watching. And think, who's, going to, who's going to do that? They're not. They're not stupid. They learned a certain amount from Napster, what happened there when they went after the people who did the downloading. Uh, you know, so it's not stupidity stuff. But 
in your situations, you're dealing with large events and you're dealing with large corporations with deep pockets and you present maybe a slightly different target. And so I'm not saying this is, it's risk identification. It's not necessarily telling you the sky is falling. But you know, if you're looking at these events and you're seeing what's going on, these are issues that you need to be asking yourself. And, and the other aspect of that is if, if you've asked, uh, if you've contacted the, uh, the rights owner and said, what would your fee be? And there's a communication between the two of you and you decide you can't, you're not gonna spend the money and then they catch you doing it on the sly, then they've got you for a lot worse of an infraction than if you'd have just done it without asking. So there, there's also that, that component of, well, we've reached out to you, we're not gonna buy it from you, and then you do it anyway. Th then your, your risk might not be higher, but your, the liability m might be much greater if you are found out. So my response to you is, as a producer, I've also been in hotels where the hotel, there will be people on staff who will actually turn you in. So then my question would be, because I've actually done this before, we have 75 surgeons at a conference and it happens to be over Super Bowl, and we have a reception and the hotel pipes in the Super Bowl into the room that we're in because there's not enough room in their public space to do it, what's, what's the risk then? The hotel could actually turn me in, is that what you're saying? It, I'm sorry. My bad. I've only seen it once, so it's rare that it's going to happen, but just from my experience, it's better to err on the side of um, safety. Caution, thank you. I, I think the message here is make sure you tip room service. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris, you have one last uh, yeah, question so, for us. So we were talking about running the three minute clip um, from the movie Rocky at the end of the event. Uh, to finish it off. Um, in that instance, does the event planner need to secure a license to run the clip from Rocky? Perfect. You're absolutely right. You do need a license, and you can typically get a license for something like this from the motion picture licensing. Uh, corporation and the nice thing about it is it gives you all of the rights you need to do that you don't need to be dealing with a PRO and all the rest of it as well on the side the the motion picture licensing corporation will indeed give you the license so the capstone from this particular section is that if you're showing a movie in public you need to have a license uh, in some respects copyright law is a little bit like cooking it's not enough to have ingredients you got to have the right ingredients if you're making chicken Kiev, well, ham and eggs aren't going to make it. You're going to need your chicken, your butter, your garlic. And similarly with copyright, depending upon what it is you're doing, you need to make sure that the rights you have and the rights that you think you're contracting for actually do what it is you hope you do. And you need to keep in mind, if you're playing music in public, you're using music in a video, or you're showing a, a, a movie in public, that you're probably going to need a license. And if you don't get a license, there's a very good chance that someone somewhere, someday, is going to stand up and say, show me the money, because it's due. We are IP Horgan. We're an intellectual property law firm based in Buffalo Grove. Uh, we have a main office in Buffalo Grove and an office in downtown Chicago. Uh, our practice focuses on copyrights, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, uh, domain names. You can find us at iphorgan.com or we represent ambition.com. Uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your time. And finally, please uh, join with me in thanking our hosts here today. Give it up for Stage Right. Chris and Dermot.
Yeah, that's, I said that. I always have to think, I think I'm saying it wrong, but I said it right, right? Derm, it works. Okay, or great. You there, it works. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your time. Um, I do want to open this up to questions. I know we had some from the audience through that, but uh, okay, we're going to push the button, and there you go. I need to um, have some walk-in music, and I don't have the right music, and I decide that I'm going to go to Pandora advertisement free. Can I use that for walk-in music? That, uh, that would, you'd have to look at your agreement with Pandora. Now, if, if, if that's a personal service that you have for, for the ad-free Pandora, I'm guessing the, the license you have to use that is possibly a pers personal license. Um, but you'd have to look at it and see exactly what it allows you to do. These, these types of licenses are very, very specific on what you can and can't do. So you'd have to look at that. I suspect it would not cover it, but I can't, couldn't say it without looking at that license. But um, you know, the other way around that would be to, to secure a, a performance rights license from ASCAP and BMI and CSAC. It's not that expensive. If you have any type of budget at all, that should, should cover you anyway. And we're not salespeople for the performing rights associations, but bear in mind when you do sign up with them and you get what they call a blanket li uh, licenses, you get everything in their catalog. So, I mean, it it's could be hundreds of thousands, millions of songs, literally. You, you get everything they have. I did want to know if Harry Fox has like an older single niece or anything. <laughs> <laughs> People are paying into that. Other questions? Um, Mike in the middle there. There we go. Do you need licensing from ASCAP, CSAC, BMI if you're uh, doing blankets uh, when you're not sure of who the, uh, has the rights on the uh, music? You, you, there, there's, there can be an issue with copyright control. There are a certain number of people who are not members of those uh, associations and they're just kind of out there. Uh, and no licenses from them, but you know, there you can go to their websites to see who's you know who's on their their catalog, uh, and, and pull it out that way, and you know, see if the ones you're pulling are are covered or not. But but practically, at an event where where stage right or someone's going to be playing lots of music, chances are some songs are going to be coming from each of the three catalogs. Almost every song is going to be handled by one of those three companies because it's it's very impractical for a, a songwriter to administer their own rights for millions of uses around the country they can't track. ASCAP and BMI and CSAC uh, sample and monitor use far better than an individual composer or could, could possibly do. So you're pretty safe. If, if you had a license with all three, you're pretty safe that every single song you, you hear will be covered. Okay. Leanne, I think. Lene, sorry. My last, this will be my last question. YouTube, I had a client ask if they could play a YouTube video at an event. I'm, I'm sorry. Did I stump the panel? Can, no, can you rephrase the question? I'm not sure. Uh, I had a client ask if we could play a YouTube video at an event. Well, that's, that's complicated, and I'll let Dermot chime in as well, but what, the issue is what, what is the content on the YouTube video who owns it? Is there some underlying copyrightable or copyrighted material in the YouTube video? So, if, for example, if there was a Michael Jackson song on the video, you're likely to have a problem. If, if, if your brother made the YouTube video and he says, fine, use it, then I think you're okay. But, you, you know, you, you can issue spot by seeing if you see some some song or some material that you know some corporation or artist is going to own, you're likely to have some type of an issue and, and, and require some type of a license. Dermot, you want yeah, to Yeah, I, I, I don't have anything it? to add to that. I think YouTube is primarily private use to the extent that stuff is up there and a lot of it is pretty questionable anyway. But again, it's fact specific in terms of what we're talking about. Is it you know, copyrighted imagery that's you know, owned by one of the major movie theaters? Is there music in there that has, that, that's you know, owned by a publisher? Depends what, what we're talking about. One other thought that comes to mind, though, is YouTube itself. I'm not sure if they would have a problem or not. I've never really encountered that. But if you 
had the YouTube logo splattered all over, and, and, and it sort of seemed like YouTube was a sponsor or an affiliate in some way, you might have some type of an issue with YouTube as well. But um, it would be very fact specific. If I hire Stage Right to do an event for me, internal meeting, and I ask for walk-in music, break music, am I responsible for getting the licenses, or will Stage Right or the company that I hire handle that? You're going to be the organizer, so the primary responsibility is going to be yours. But obviously, this is probably something that you can address in your agreement with Stage Right and ask them to make sure that they include the license and that you know just deal with it that way. Obviously, that's still not going to protect you if they don't get it. So you need to make sure that the licenses are in place. But the primary responsibility is going to be on the event host. Okay, back row. Um, I have a question about uh, live performance of music. If, if the event planner hires a band and they're playing commercial music for, say, a large audience, what, is, is that on the band or is that on the planner to make sure they have some type of license for playing those mu that music? Again, it's going to be primarily on the planner. Nobody sues the band. They sue the venue. They sue the, the host whoever really is the person making the primary money from that, they're, they're going to have to be the primary liability. But, but, the, but there actually needs to be a license purchase. There should be a license saying. first. There should okay. be a PRO license covering the performance of the underlying composition. Gotcha. Okay, back row again, and we'll start coming forward. Sorry, guys. Kind of a follow-up to that. I hire the same thing. I hire people to play in our exhibit hall. That might be three or four people just playing walk-in music or whatever. How do I know whether I use BMI or ASCAP? I mean, I, the checks are inconsequential that you're writing. I mean, they're 150, 200 bucks or what I'm doing. But is there one that covers them? Because a lot of this stuff is decided at the 11th hour. I don't know who these guys are. Who's covering it? Um, that, that pretty much is so if, they're, if, if you don't have control over the songs they're playing, if you just say play music for half an hour right. and it's music that's still susceptible to copyright, in other words, it wasn't written 700 years ago, likely some material from each of the three catalogs of ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC will be played. So you're safest to probably to get all three. Now, if you want one song played, you can look on their websites and find out which one of the three has that artist or that song and then pay one license. But practically speaking, if you tell a band or a stage right play music for three hours, one of them is not going to cover it. Okay. Go ahead, please. Um, what about clips that might be embedded into, embedded into um, videos of the speakers or presenters? Um, I'm also a, I'm an AMC. So uh, is the responsibility on my company as an AMC, on the individual nonprofit that we are contracted with, or on the speaker? Well, um, I'm so, so you said you're an MC. I'm, I'm sorry. An MC is presenting. Okay. And yep. in that presentation, they use clips that are embedded in a video uh, that's part of your actually, presentation? Actually, my company is an association management company, so I work with nonprofits or small medical conferences. Um, doctors are notorious for running in with their flash drive five minutes before their presentation. If there is something embedded in Just that, doctors are? Yeah, yeah <laughs> for a, not, not all, okay. Yeah. So any speaker, you know, what is our liability if a speaker has a clip in their presentation? Oh, well, you know, Dermot, do you have a thought on I that? Think it's more, I, think it's, I, think, I think it's like the band, quite honestly, playing the music. I think you're going to be primarily responsible. You're going to be primarily the host that's there. And again, it's like what I said about George Harrison. It doesn't matter that you didn't intend that there be infringement or any of that. It's really going to be the deepest pockets. So as the organizers, can we get licenses on behalf of all of our like one license that would cover all of our events, even though the events are done for different clients? Uh, we've looked at ASCAP and, and BMI uh, contracts, and you, you can have a 
a, um, a license for a number of events over the course of the year, and you report at certain um, periods. And so the license can cover more than a single event. But you have to catalog what you do. And, and if, you, if you go on the ASCAP uh, website, for example, there's lots of different types of licenses you can get. But if you, you can get a uh, license for special events that are more than a single event. Okay. I, you, OK, thank you. Scott. Um, a charity, uh, or it's not a charity event, but just for the local church, we'll do a one time a year, we'll, we'll play a video and just a lot of people come and hang out in the parking lot and watch a video. It, it is a movie. Um, so a couple times you said who's benefiting from it is, so if nobody's paying to be there, if it's not a silent auction, they're just the church members, is, does that make a difference? It makes a difference to the royalty rate you're going to pay. Most, I mean, the Motion Picture Licensing Corporation, for instance, does have a charity uh, model that they use, so you're probably going to end up paying a reduced rate, but you still need a license. It doesn't change that. Do you have any idea what, what the fees uh, are? I can, um, um, a couple of years ago, we, uh, on behalf of a, a religious organization, they did exactly what you're describing, did a, a video for a, a certain anniversary and we got uh, licenses from the, the music companies and they didn't charge anything. But it was still a license and it still defined what's the video gonna be, how long is it gonna be, where it's gonna be shown, how many people. So you still have to have a license, like Dermot said, but it, in that instance, there was no payment. Um, but but they, they wanna be very careful that you're not gonna then turn around and do something else with it. Um, so you have to tell them what you're doing, and, and it's, it's... Mike in the back. I have a question. Could you clarify whether it's fact or fiction? Can, can, a, can we play short snippets of audio up to so many bars or 10 seconds of a video without... Is there a time of play that gets us in under copyright infringement? Um, well, there's a, there's a concept called the de, minimis, de minimis use, which, under which you, you are kind of free from copyright liability, but that has to be litigated. So if, um, I, don't, I don't believe there's any bright line that says, well, if you use nine seconds of Rocky or, or some motion picture, you're safe. But if you use 10, you're not. You can get sued, and then you might be able to use a defense and say, well, this is just a de minimis use. But the whole idea here is to try to avoid being sued. So I, I would think you don't want to gamble and say, well, I'm just using a little bit. Because okay. that's, that's a complicated legal analysis that a, a judge and a jury will examine. It. But you don't want to ever get there. Okay. So I don't want to draw that line. And it could also be that you're taking the most decisive moment you know, I mean, we had the example from Hadrian in Rocky. That's one of the decisive moments in the movie. That's going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So these are the considerations. Ladies and gentlemen, I, th I think what I'd like to do is, I know you have questions, and I'm seeing them, and, and I know that the folks from, from, I always want to make sure I say it, and I, I'm not, I don't know why I'm having such a brain fart on that. I.P. Horgan is, is going to stay. Now, this is not a moment where we have, like, Bruce Toons turns to her. Chris does have to leave. Um, so Janine is going to stay. She's also a representative of the firm and, and answer questions. So um, with that, I, I, I think it probably would be good. We'll, we'll open up. There are beverages and food for everybody. And uh, I want to thank everybody for, you know, for your time and coming up. Uh, so a round of applause for the gentleman here. One last, and one last note, um, we do have all of this set up for you. And one of the cool things that you can do as an event planner, meeting planner, person who's interested, somebody who thinks this is geeky stuff, you're welcome to come back behind the curtain and ask the guys and maybe punch some buttons and, well, you ask them if you can punch the buttons. But, you know, get in there and learn what can this stuff do because it's not often that you can really kind of look behind the curtain and talk to the great Oz. So please do that. And once again, from all of us at Stage Right, thank you. Thank you for your time, your attention, your willingness to be here. We will follow up with additional information. I'm thinking I'm going to ask for some of the websites and numbers of the places that they said that you should go and look for and that type of thing. A lot is on the, di uh, is on the little drive, but we will follow up with other stuff. 
but gosh, it's been great to have you here at the first one. Um, we hope to have you and bring each one of you, bring five of your friends at the next one, and uh, we'll keep in touch. So thanks, and have a great night. You know, enjoy.